Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our last webcast of 2020, what year it's been. Um, we are talking today about vendor master data, integrity, governance, keeping your vendor master data clean. And in the, in the uh, spirit of COVID, we have to wash our hands and keep your vendor master data clean. But this is more than just keeping data clean, it's about integrity and governance. And this uh, last webcast of the year, we have Special guest speaker Deborah Richardson, and I'll introduce her imminently. So um, let us move into the introductions. My name is Dan French. I'm founder and CEO of Consider Solutions. I know many of you, so uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, we had a very hectic year this year. I'm very pleased to welcome Deborah Richardson, who is um, who runs her own uh, her own business, but she's got a lot of experience in. Uh, AP and P2P, and specifically in vendor master data. She's an expert, a consultant, a thought leader, and speaker. Welcome, Deborah. Thanks, Dan. Happy to be here. Thanks, Deborah. And Steve Fox in Carlsbad, California, who's former vice president of GBS at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and knows has the uh, the bruises and uh, cuts associated with experiencing the problems with master data. Now the process excellence leader at Consider Solutions. Welcome, Steve. Great, Dan. Thanks. So these are your three um, uh, speakers for the day. Um, session is as follows. It's 45 minutes. We're going to have Q and A at the end. So hopefully you can stay with us for the full 45. Please ask questions as we go through. You've got a Q and A panel on your GoToWebinar interface. Ask questions as we go through. Anything that's, that hits your mind, get it down early because that really adds. Um, depth and breadth to the uh, to the webcast. If you've got any technical issues, use the same interface and one of our folks will try and help you out. So I'm gonna um, introduce a little bit with some context and then I'm gonna ask Steve Fox to talk about master data as the engine of shared services, the engine of global business services. And from his experience of leading a global business services organization, I think we're gonna learn some very interesting perspectives there. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And then Deborah is gonna give us a talk through the kind of the, her eight steps regime the cleaning vendor master data, what's important, what sequence you need to do it in, and, and how to make sure the, um, the issues don't bite you. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk uh, about sustaining again this idea of continuous vendor vigilance or continuance, uh, continuous vendor master data monitoring, if you like. And then we're going to have some thoughts for the road, and I'll come back at the end. We've got four polls for you, so you want you to be involved. We're going to keep you engaged and awake, depending what time of the day it is with you. And um, so be prepared for that. So, a bit of context, why are we running this webcast? Well, as many of you know, we, at Consider, we kind of, we're working with organizations who are aspiring to this idea of world-class or best-in-class finance and operations, uh, best-in-class, world-class shared services, uh, best-in-class, world-class GBS. And we define that on the left-hand side, pretty simple, as in helping the organization as a whole drive better business results driving down the cost of finance and operations, optimizing cash flow and having better risk management. And we deliver that in those pillars on the right. So better financial control and compliance and techniques and processes and technologies for that, uh, broader enterprise risk management. And on the right hand side, this idea of process transformation, process optimization, which is very much, I guess it's a topic of today, but you could argue the vendor master data hits all three of those pillars. And uh, obviously everything these days can't really be executed effectively without a good understanding of technology and data. So we have a bunch of global influences. We have clients around the world and this is a selection of them. Uh, these guys help us and encourage us to, they challenge us with questions to find ways of doing things better, making business more efficient, more effective. And they often give us sort of uh, challenges to work out how we can uh, tackle particular issues of the day. Uh, and this that stimulates webcasts like this and many of the others ones we do. So thank you all for joining and, and many of you are also on this webcast today. So um, start with a little poll. This one's an easy one. Um, this is how do you define your role? Would you self-define yourself as primarily shared services or global business services? Would you primarily define yourself as procurement or sourcing? Number three, would you predominantly identify, sorry, would you uh, predominantly identify yourself as finance? four, IT, IS, or five, another function. So pretty straightforward, how do you define yourself? Is it one, two, three, four, or five? 
um, should be very straightforward. So let's have a look at what you say. This is a bit of context for us all. It's all anonymous, so nobody matters. Um, right, that's great. So 50% of you are shared services GBS, followed by finance and followed by procurement. So that's a pretty good cross section. So, um, so you're in good company. So that's great news. Thank you for that. Uh, right, so you will notice some of the uh, imagery associated with this webcast is rather uh, gloomy associated with what as ex we've experienced in 2020. But, you know, this this year has been definitely nothing any of us were expecting. And the the virus has obviously had a lot of negative impacts and all the health impacts and all the rest of it. But it has actually, in an unusual way, done some positive things for business. Um, and I regard this as COVID driven cultural transformation. So if you cast your mind back to March, we suddenly managed to find on a sixpence on a dime to be able to move to a much faster response and action um, because we had no choice. We had to move to remote separated work immediately. And organizations, even major organizations, managed to do that incredibly quickly and far better and more effectively than anybody ever imagined. We ended up with more contactless interfaces and interactions because we needed to, there were no choices. We had to integrate end to end processes without manual intervention or without as much manual intervention because it was necessary because it weren't, you know, we couldn't have too many manual handoffs. That's accelerated digitization in a much more focused way, maybe than before. And it's definitely made us aware that data is ever more the essential component of digitization, both in terms of the glue in the digitization, but also the way in which to measure our, our progress. So, in a funny way, with all these unusual things, there's been some positives associated with it as well. Now, when you look at master data, um, master data often gets uh, you know a, a short, uh, you know, short sort of impact or, or, or not not enough attention, if you like. But Hackett Group did some great analysis, and these are correlations, of course, and not necessarily causations. But if you look at those stats, basically those organisations who had world class standards in master data definitions and management ran with about a third of the staff and about a third of the finance cost of the lowest. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing, right? Now, obviously, it's not just the master data that did it, but it's part of a package of measures that, that drive towards world class. And I think you'll see that, uh, you see some of the data points there, 33% less rework from processes, it, you know, it's really very, very impressive. And even if you say, well, we, we were never a low standards organization, but even, even compared to the highest data standards organizations, you're almost talking nearly a 50% cut, maybe 40% cut in costs and headcount. So that's a pretty important uh, thing to bear in mind. If you need that to convince management that master data needs attention, there you go. Now, in purchase to pay, source to pay, accounts payable, you look at the end to end process, this is our classic process here. Now, you know, many, of, you know, many of you are, are P2P um, or even GBS uh, leaders who have a kind of a view across the whole piece, but most organizations don't yet have full end to end process ownership. And many of you who are accounts payable are really dealing with that settlement piece on the right. But we know in whichever role we operate, we know that on the right hand side is where 95% of the issues pop up and 95% of those are caused to the left hand side. So we know that this end to end process thinking helps us both identify root cause issues and get rid of them. And it also helps us make the end, end to end process work more effectively. There's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of participants, but the bit we often forget is the glue of all that is vendor master data. Across all of that, whether you're in procurement or buying or paying or receiving, if the vendor master data isn't good, all of us are compromised. So um, that's kind of well worth thinking about. Now, many of you know we did a, a big, a very effective and successful um, P2P survey at the end of last year, which we announced the results of earlier this year. And um, that was over 500 organizations worldwide. It was you know, kind of really interesting and it was really objective and it was broad based. And I thought it's good to bring some things in here. So the key pain points identified associated with accounts payable or invoice to pay with these. Now, by far and away, the biggest issue is avoiding late payments. But if you look at PO compliance, duplicated invoices, uh, invoices and exceptions to invoices, fraud risk associated with vendor uh, bank and payment details, 
all of those have a massive relationship to effective and uh, valid vendor master data, which was number two. So it's no surprise that anybody in accounts payable knows the vendor master data is absolutely central to their success. On the flip side, when you look at the front end, the left hand side of the process, when we ask the key pain points in the source to contract, the procurement process, this was a sequence and it's a very different focus as you'd expect. So number one was lack of contract visibility. Do we know what we've agreed for all our suppliers and all our contracts? Do we have effective spend categories so we can understand where we're spending money and how we're driving efficiencies? Reducing the cycle time of the process for the buyers. Um, do we know what we're getting the terms we agreed in contract compliance? So we go to a great lengths to get these contracts. Are we getting what we agreed? And do we have visibility over supplier vendor performance? What's interesting there is that doesn't immediately leap to vendor master data directly, although some of it does relate to it. So it, it does help explain why sometimes vendor, vendor master data doesn't get all of the coherent focus across the end-to-end -end process. And many of you will know we did a LinkedIn poll just the past seven days, we just closed earlier today. It was asking that very question, why does vendor master integrity and governance fail to get priority focus and attention? Because most people tell us it does. And this is you know, you know, very thought provoking, I guess. 51% of people said it was lack of ownership and champion for vendor master data. That was the reason. It's not a weak business case. It's not lack of resources, which surprised me actually. Um, and if you add the lack of process alignment across P2P and you put, you know, relate that to ownership and a champion, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, that's 83% of people believe it's about ownership, alignment, collaboration, championing the process. So there's um, some interesting data points. So. That's me giving you a little bit of introduction. I'd like now to hand over to Steve Fox, as I say, former VP Global Business Services at Thermo Fisher. Steve, tell us about Master Data as the engine of shared services. Wonderful, thank you, Dan, and uh, and, and everybody. I appreciate your your time wherever you're joining um, us from around the world. So first of all, I just want to kind of share a little bit of um, of my experience, and um, it's uh, um, back in. Well, let's see here. Sorry. Hopefully I'm not making you all dizzy. So, um, so first of all, just from a from a, a, a experience perspective on, on my part, I've I've worked in in shared services, global business services environments for for a number of years. It's kind of hard number for me to say. Really, over the last 30 years, I've been involved in this, and and, and I started with a uh, with a pilot project and really leading of uh, uh, you know we we didn't use the term P2P back in 1993, but leading um leading a, effectively a P2P organization and a pilot. Um, shared service center startup in in Phoenix, Arizona. So you kind of fast forward through, you know, the last 27 years. Um, I've 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 had an opportunity to to be involved in a number of a number of shared service center setups, brownfield, greenfield, literally across the globe. And it's really, uh, you know, as Dan mentioned earlier, I've kind of got the scar tissue to prove it, if you will. Um, and, um, and and it really opened my eyes to a lot of things around. Um, what you know, P2P leaders, AP leaders, GBS leaders, you know, order to cash leader space kind of day in and day out in, um, in, in what we're challenged with with doing and delivering for, for our organizations. So just a high level, some lessons that I've learned over the years, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, some of these focus on kind of, you know, the, the, the commitment and the, and the cost aspect of shared services and, you know, kind of getting this false sense of security. You know, when you have executive um, sponsorship and that it really becomes a, a, an issue of dealing with stakeholders. Cost reduction, I think, goes, goes without saying, you know, initially it's not, not difficult, um, but over, over, the, over the quarters and years, it becomes harder and harder to deliver that productivity and that value proposition, right? Um, but a, a couple of things that really came, came kind of the forefront to me um, around defects and process, process standardization really center around vendor master data. And I'll say, I, you know, for the purposes of today, it's vendor master data, but you, you know, it can be customer master data, item master data, you know, company code data, et cetera. But, um, but what I found over, over the years, you know, as I became more focused on defects and how that affects my productivity, it became evident that, that vendor master data plays a massive role in this, right? It's foundational to effectively every transaction that goes through our systems. Um, and that, you know, when, when a lot of us think of process standardization, we tend to think of, you know, kind of end-to-end P2P workflows and how that, how that can make us be, you know, more efficient and more effective. But, but I think it's really important that we're looking, you know, kind of applying those same kind of thought processes around standardization to, to, to vendor master data and to the nomenclature we use, right? Because so many, 
so many defects and issues um, are the result of not having accurate core data. So, you know, when I look at, at, at master data and kind of as the, you know, the, the cornerstone of a lot of, of what we are challenged with doing kind of day in and day out, right, it's critical. It's the source of truth that really drives credibility in our reporting, drives credibility in, 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 in how we look at the transactional activity that's, throw, uh, that's flowing through our teams. Um, like it's, it's a big part, right, of, of how, we, how we strategize, right? Because, you know, without accurate data and accurate, you know, foundational data, it, it becomes difficult to, to have trust and credibility in, in the metrics, in the, um, in, the, in the objectives and goals we set. And then I think a big part of this is um, um, when we think about uh, the suppliers we're dealing with day in and day out is, is how, do we, how do we look at our relationship with them, right? How do we aggregate that relationship? And without accurate, and I'll, I'll say accurate, but accurate and maintained vendor master data, it becomes very difficult to look um, at how our suppliers are working with us and, 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 and how we're, you know, where our spend is as an example. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in the, later in the presentation here. Um, and, uh, and, and I think finally here around risk and compliance, it really is critical. I mean, I think, you know, many of us can look at transactional defects, transactional flaws, and whether it's a duplication of some sort, you know, in many cases, it can be root cause straight back to uh, a vendor master data issue in, in some form or fashion. So, um, you know, I think about the rationale for, you know, that I've used to develop or sell people on, 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 on you know, how important vendor master data can be. I really, you know, bucket in these three areas. You know, there's financial objectives, operational rationale, and, and, and strategic approaches, right? And I think just to kind of, you know, sum this up a little bit, it centers around making sure you've, you've, you, you can assess, you can accurately assess the viability of, of the vendors and suppliers you're doing business with, right? You know, we, obviously we rely on, 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 these, um, on these partners, right, for, for kind of the day in and day out goods and services that are provided to us. And, and, um, and we really need to understand kind of how, how, big of a, how big of a part of their revenue portfolio are we, right? Um, and, and is there a risk there? And, and do we have sole, uh, you know, kind of sole source relationships there that could really hinder our ability to do what we need to do moving forward? And I think that ties into the operational aspect as well. Um, and looking at, you know, hey, do, is this a relationship that we want to expand or, or, or well, does it make a better, does it make more sense to compress it? Um, and then strategic, right? I know we all, man, many of us have, have embarked on different initiatives, whether it's, you know, e-invoicing or whether it's, you know, a diversity program, a supplier diversity program. Um, without accurate vendor master data kind of underpinning all of this, those things become very difficult to do. Um, so, and, and just as a kind of a, a little bit of a capstone example here, right? I mean, it, for me, you know, ADP, which was a payroll provider for us, and I was leading, a, you know, part of my GBS was was leading payroll globally, and 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 you know, I had over 30 different arrangements across across the globe with ADP, but ADP looked at looked at all those. They looked at me as as 30 different customers, right? And 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 that's not how I looked at me. I looked at me as one big customer of ADP globally, um, and. And I think, you know, with, with the things Deborah will take us through and, and some of the things I'll follow up on, it, it's important to understand, right, uh, those, those relationships we have out there and that we are looked at in aggregate and that we are valued in, in all the business that we give our suppliers. And, and that, you know, and, and typically they're not going to tell us that. They're, they're you know, they're, they may know it, but they're waiting for us to tell them. And um, so I think that's you know, important kind of underpinnings of all of this is accurate, maintain vendor master data. So now we got we've got a couple polls we're gonna we're gonna go through. The first one here is um I think you, you know you doing the assessment of your vendor master data um and, and you know whether you know you think about the, the the governance the the quality of the process and the integrity of the data you can see the four options here um and please uh, please select one you know the first one is you know you've got strong high quality high data integrity um, second is, hey, you know, we, 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 we focus on it. We've got some governance. You know, we kind of maybe pay attention to it here and there. Uh, the third option is, boy, it, it needs some attention. We just, we're, we're not sure where we're at or even what we're doing. And then the fourth is, overall, we're, we're, we're weak and, 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 and we're, on this, we're on this webcast because of that. So please uh, take a second and make a choice. So it is anonymous, so don't worry. You're not yep, going to... Uh... Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, okay, we got about half uh, 
half of the uh, half of the respondents here have some governance and and, and but have some completeness issues. Um, good to see we've got about a quarter of you feel very strongly about where you're at. So I think there's some things where if we could we, we could all learn you could you could share with uh, share as we move forward. So the next poll um, is um, bring that up real quick. The next poll is just uh, on your ERP. We're having trouble going forward, Steve. Yeah, should be going. There you go. Oh no, you're going okay. too far. Oh, too far. Let's go. Okay. Sorry. Back up. Okay. So sorry about that, guys. Uh, so so pretty simple question here. Primary ERP that that your P2P process is that your business works um, within. Uh, please, uh, you know, you got SAP, Oracle, Infor, Microsoft, or other. Please just select one. You think about this is the primary ERP. I know a number of us are in multi ERP environments, so please select one, and we'll uh, share those results. It's anonymous again. Three, two, one. Very good. Okay, uh, almost two thirds uh, operating in, in, in SAP, and as we would kind of expect and imagine, you know, the mass majority between SAP and Oracle very, very common. So thank you very much for that. And um, so now I will, um, I'm, I'm really pleased and, and, and happy to um, introduce to you uh, Deborah Richardson. Deborah will um, uh, walk us through kind of her experience, her, um, her, um, her process that she takes uh, clients through. And um, Deborah, I'll hand it over to you. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so key steps to clean your vendor master data in your vendor master file. Um, but before we talk about that, I do just want to briefly talk about my journey and the vendor team slash vendor master data gap that uh, I really set out to, to fill. So I have uh, 20 years experience in corporate finance across oil and gas, automotive, healthcare, and telecom industries. And I spent the last 12 years in accounts payable. Now I am a previous AP senior manager in shared services of a Fortune 20 company where I was over both global vendor setup and global payments for 140,000 active vendors across seven different ERPs. Now, as a practitioner across those several industries, handling accounts payable, and then finally focusing on vendor setup and maintenance and payments at uh, Verizon, there was definitely a gap in the tools and the training for the vendor team and just the vendor master data overall. You know, whenever you heard about or hear about accounts payable automation, it was always focusing on invoices. Well, you can't post invoices if you don't have a vendor record set up in your vendor master file. And you can't pay vendors if you don't have accurate remit information. And then once that information is in your vendor master file, you can't let cyber criminals change it and you can't let that information become stale lest you increase your potential for regulatory fines. You have to add authentication techniques, internal controls, and best practices. So I set out to fill that gap. And one way was providing best practices to clean your vendor master file. Get to the next. All right. And we know the risks of poor vendor master data integrity, both internal and external risk of payment fraud, and then the operational risk of duplicate payments, you know, or maybe you don't have an accurate vendor list for that AP automation project, or maybe those IRS or really even worse, um, OFAC fines that have been assessed because your vendor information is stale. So you need to clean, uh, clean up your vendor master file. Okay. 
So vendor master file cleanup. So I do recommend um, to continue this process, preferably monthly, um, but it can also be done quarterly, semi-annually. Um, at the very least, it definitely needs to be done annually. Now I have eight steps and I recommend that the first step always be to inactivate or deactivate um, vendors that you have not done business with in 15, 18, or 20 four months. Whatever you decide is best for your company. Um, you'll check inactivity across POs, invoicing, payments, and the last modified date on the vendor record. Now, if you don't remember the last time you inactivated vendors, meaning it's been years, then you'll likely see a decrease in your active vendors um, uh, of about 30 to 50%. And really, that's why you do this uh, step first, because once you inactivate or deactivate 30 to 50% um, of your vendors, depending on how long um, you've got between uh, 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 inactivating them, um, now you've got fewer active vendors that you need to take through the rest of the seven steps. So um, inactivating vendors is key. Um, it also ensures that you have less vendors that have that are accessible for internal and external fraud. Now, now that you have your 30 to 50% um, of your vendors um, inactivated or whatever percentage based on how long you've last done that, um, we can move on to step two with the remaining vendors, the address validation and standardization. Now, this one is important. If you want that check payment, and we know we all still have them to reach your vendor, um, because uh, you definitely don't want rework or the achievement process to kick in for those in the U.S. Also, for those in the U.S., you definitely don't want those 1099s and 1042s that you're getting ready to send out to come back. So you want to make sure that address is mailable and you want to also make sure that the address is not vacant, inactive, or is only a PO box, which can be an indicator of fraud. So this is an important step. Now, these next four steps are all about validation. So I, I do recommend that you separate um, the registration numbers such as tax IDs, VAT, or GST based on um, the home country, which is why there are two steps here, one for home country and then the next one for uh, the uh, foreign countries. Um, for example, if you were on, uh, if you're in the U.S., in this first validation would be for the IRS tax ID. Since there would be more U.S. vendors and those fines and penalties for reportable vendors can be steep. Um, if you're in the U.K., you want to focus on VAT numbers. Or if you're in Canada, maybe you want to focus on the business number or GST slash HST uh, taxes. Um, once you do that for your home country, again, that's where you have the, the uh, largest volume of your vendors. Then you can focus on the remaining vendors, verifying either the format or um, the vendor legal name and the registration number if a resource is available. Lots of times, depending on the country, the the only thing that you can really do is verify the format, but you do need to do one or the other. So once you validate the vendor registration numbers, then you need to validate the vendor bank details and really on two levels if you can. Um, the first level is at the vendor level um, and this is a hot topic um, because bank account ownership validation is available and that definitely ends payment fraud such as business email compromise. Um, so if you have this service, say with early warning or GAIAC that really focuses on the U.S. or um, NS Knox that focuses on U.S. and international, you need to validate that this information is still good. 
but you also need to validate the bank details at the bank branch level as well because banks are always merging or acquiring one another and your vendors will never tell you because they may not have paid attention so you need to verify that routing number swift code or bit code and update those in your files and a great example of that is SunTrust and B B and T uh, banks just merged to a new name, Truist, and that routing number is new. So if you have any vendors in your vendor master file with the SunTrust or BB and T routing numbers, you may risk the notice of changes or knocks from your bank. And if you don't make that change in a timely fashion, you could now be looking at or then be looking at a notch of fine. So this is an important step to reduce fraud and regulatory fines. So next, the sanction and exclusion list. We all know about OFAC, um, but there's also the Office of Inspector General or OIG if you're a medical facility, um, the System of Award Management or SAM if you are a U.S. government um, organization. You need to verify that your vendors have not been added to these lists since you onboarded them. Um, and if you make daily or weekly payments to vendors, that um, subsequently uh, uh, fall on one of these exclusion lists, there could be hefty penalties and fines. And that is one reason I recommend that this process be done um, monthly. And I've seen uh, some companies just perform the exclusion list um, uh, more often uh, than that if you want to separate this step out. Um, and not only do you need to check for your vendor, but also for your vendor bank. Uh, U.S. entities are not only not to do business with vendors, if that makes sense, um, that are on the OFAC list, but the same applies to vendor banks. So when you're looking up your vendors, also check your vendor banks as well. Now, you can um, get a list of the top 20 banks that you don't need to check for because we know they won't be on the list, but the, next, uh, the rest really needs to be checked. And while you're at it, check that the countries match. So where the bank country does not equal the vendor country, that can be an indicator of fraud. To the next one. All right, and so now we're to the last two steps. The next one is other regulatory and third parties, and this is really um, a catch-all. These can be those resources that are unique to your industry. Uh, maybe you need to check for insurance certificates, maybe done in Bradstreet for hierarchy or credit worthiness if you include that as part of your vendor process. Um, it could be at the vendor level or at the bank level. Um, Again, this is really a catch-all of what was not included in the steps above. And now to the last step. Um, and just like I recommended the inactivation or deactivation of vendors be your first step, I do recommend that analyzing um, your vendor records be your last step. Um, now that you have validated, at this point in the process, now that you have validated and standardized that information, um, you can do an accurate duplicate review, um, which is part of this step. In my experience, if you try to do a duplicate review without first having standardized and validated the information, you'll miss many duplicates. Um, so validating and standardizing first means that you can better compare vendor legal names, addresses, and tax IDs to find duplicates. And once you find those duplicates, you can then determine based on OPPOs, invoices, um, which vendor record will survive and which one needs to be inactivated. And, you know, this is an important step to eliminate those duplicate payments. Um, the other important part of this step is the follow-up. So for those where the validations were unsuccessful or where the data was missing, um, such as email address or tax ID, you need to reach out to those vendors to get that mi uh, missing information, then standardize it and validate it. And then once you've done that, you can then perform the duplicate review again 
for that vendor data to see if you have any duplicates based on the information coming in. So you can see that this is an, an ongoing step. Um, and th this was my, you know, eight steps to cleaning your uh, vendor master data. And this is something that absolutely um, needs to be done. Getting your vendor master file clean is, is important. Um, but you should be just as vigilant to keep it clean. And so now I'll turn it um, back over to Steve um, to talk more about how to be vigilant and how to keep your vendor master file clean. Steve? Outstanding. Thank you, Deborah. And, and, and Deborah, appreciate you know, the expertise, the, 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 the outstanding level of detail there. And, and all of us can uh, have, a, have a high degree of appreciation for, uh, for now the steps to go through and, and some, of the, some of the diligence that's really needed up front to establish this. So what I'm going to talk about real quickly here is share with you some, some, some kind of tools and, and, and tips that I've used to kind of drive this um this diligence around maintaining uh clean vendor master data and so you know i think we can all relate to to kind of this pic these pictures here around having kind of a a garden that needs to be tended to and and you get it clean and you kind of get it nice and pretty the way you want it and then you know if you take your eye off it six months later right here we are um you know right back where we where we started and so this is all about kind of kind of eliminating that that um that, that process and that flow um so it, it, Questions. It's sorry. It's uh, it's interesting here, right? You know, there's there's a there's a question here around um, you know how many countries are there in the world, right? And it seems like a pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward question. But depending on the context and depending on the meaning you're looking to to get from that, there's many different answers, right? And I think that that goes for clearly for for data and data, you know, the 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 nuance and the context that's important for all of us to understand. Um, and um, and so what I'll what I'll share with you here is the um, you know, master data in the context of an overall P2P kind of dashboard. So this is a dashboard that I've had in place and, and leveraged um, over the years. And, and it really is meant to look at productivity, defects, compliance. But a key part of this always was, it's kind of hard to see some of the kind of bottom left third there, vendor master data is always something that I wanted to have some alerts on, either duplicates, on data quality. Um, and so this is something that I used to help just keep my, myself and my team aware of any vendor master data issues that that could crop up. Um, next is uh, thinking in the terms of you know kind of Deborah mentioned duplicates, and um, this is an example of a of a quick dashboard where you know it's highlighting duplicates, and you know you can look at a duplicate uh, exercise of trying to eliminate duplicates and go through the inactivation step. That like, man, this is massive, and 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 it's something you know maybe. Maybe you look at it and say, this is really something I don't have a, a, a time or resources to, to address today. But what this does, what this did is, is really focus that effort and said, hey, you know, I've got vendors out there that look like dupes. They've had invoices and payments processed against those. That's what I'm going to prioritize. That's what I want to go tackle. I can go deal with those 19, right? It's a little bit harder in, in some cases to get my head around dealing with hundreds or thousands of these. But if I can really segment my focus and work on those 19, I can make some uh, I can make some impact at least you know very quickly and initially. And this is an example of um, you know where where dupes can be hidden right and you can look here you know different vendor ID the name doesn't look like it's related you know two totally different kind of names um, but you look address similar and then you really kind of get to the key point here the VAT ID in this case the VAT ID is exactly the same right so you know, this is where you kind of use that drill down functionality here to look at the actual detail and you're like yep those are those are related and I should go address that. Um, the next item I looked at was around payment terms. I think we can all relate to dealing with suppliers, um, you know, in either different parts of, of a country or different parts of the world where, where we set up different payment terms based off the relationship that was, that was agreed to or we thought we agreed to it. And this is an example just on the right hand side where you can see there's, you know, six different payment terms for, for, the, for arguably, the, you know, for what is the same supplier. Um, it, it's going to have a big impact um, on your um, on your on your cash flow, depending on the size of the suppliers, as well as kind of the follow-up that gets um, you know sent our way in the payables organization around past due invoices. So really, having an eye on that can make a big difference in overall productivity. And then the um, you know kind of the, the the next item here, we, you know, we tailspin's always a, a hot topic, and and I think as I mentioned, kind of the ADP example before. 
it's hard to have an appreciation for what your true tail spend is, right? If you if you can't properly aggregate um, um, your suppliers and, and look at um, the relationship in total. Um, and this is just a, a, an example of a, of a dashboard that I've used in, in the past that really kind of helps, you know, uh, people visualize tail spend, but you, you can't do this accurately if you're not able to, to look at the total relationship, which vendor master data really, really helps you do. And I think kind of the capstone here, right, is is this is a this is a supplier scorecard now I'm, I'm not i'm not saying everybody's you know going to be putting in supplier scorecards across their entire uh vendor population right but you know i started this with 25 suppliers and then branched it out to 50 and 100 um and and this was really how i told the story right and 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 conveyed the story both internally and externally to our suppliers on on our relationship and how we're doing with one another how we feel about it um and and as you can imagine right the critical aspect of having this be meaningful and accurate and credible is vendor master data. If your vendor master data is not accurate and maintained, then this becomes a very difficult uh, picture to paint and story to tell. But um, um, and 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 I think there's an opportunity that you know people are missing out on on really leveraging their relationships in the best way possible um, without having accurate vendor master data that then feeds into into a mechanism like this. So with that, Dan, I'll turn it over to you to, to kind of take us home. Thank you very much, Steve. Some uh, great insights there. And thank you very much, Deborah, for your uh, eight steps. So I'm going to um, bring us to a conclusion. And you've got some questions coming through already. Please ask any more questions. If we don't have time to answer them all verbally, we will do them by email. But the more questions, the better. So get them all in there. So I'm going to be quick so I can get to the questions. Yeah, you know, this has been a rough old year, but it isn't going to get any less rough. So uh, that's just an observation, right? It's a, and it's a good picture. Um, we've talked about master data being the end-to-end -end process enabler. I think both Deborah and Steve have made that abundantly clear, so I don't need to uh, to labour that any further. And this idea of of sustaining, you know, getting us getting your vendor master data clean and having some sustainable model to to uh, to keep it clean and that continuous vigilance that Steve talked about is pretty key. And you know, vendor master data plus all the other insights that Steve referred to, that kind of enables us to take a much bigger view, a high level view of our business operations in shared services, GBS or finance operations. You know, it helps us work out where resources are going to be needed. It helps us improve processes, both upstream and downstream. You know, identify those compliance or fraud issues before we lose money. Influence our leadership to drive further uh, leverage of our these shared common services. Obviously, negotiate better supplier terms and pricing, as Steve talked about with the supplier scorecard, and also tell the story of a P2P process journey, both within the context of your, all your stakeholders across the organisation, and also during M&A activity. So that's a pretty key thing. Got one final poll for you. This is about audit comments. So you know, we all know <laughs> we all know about audit comments, right? So just quick, quickly here again, it's uh, it's anonymous. One, I've never had any audit comments associated with vendor master data. Two. We have vendor master audit comments in the past, but they're now resolved. Three, we have current vendor master audit comments being addressed. And four, it's a hot key issue yet to be addressed. Um, let's see what the score is. So come on, it should be pretty straightforward. One, two, three, or four, or four. Um, so um, if you've never had any audit comments associated with vendor master data, you're very lucky. Um, but so, so I imagine most people are two, three, or four. How are we doing? Let's have a look at the results because we haven't got a lot of time. So, oh, wow, there's a percentage of, it's nearly 17% of you have never had a problem with it. Um, that's amazing. So, um, but 42% resolved and 37% you know, in work and a few of you have got big issues. Okay, well, at least you know you're all in good company. So, some takeaways for you. I'm going to come to your questions now, some takeaways for you. If you want some deeper learning and guidance, Deborah has been very kind to offer us her resources, her downloads, her blog, her podcasts. You can get to it here. We're going to share this with you by email anyway afterwards. So if you don't have time to write it down, you're going to get this. Um, subscribe to Deborah's Vendor Master YouTube channel. If this is you or your colleagues or somebody close to you whose job responsibility it is, make sure you sign up to Deborah's uh, material. She's, uh, she's on top of the topic. If you want to engage in that five-day uh, vendor master cleanup, um, the, so Deborah has a five-day cleanup engagement. It's a high-impact head start. It's amazing what you can achieve. Email Deborah if you want to talk about it or just find out about it. Um, so the email address there, and I'll again share that. 
And if you're interested in this idea of the continuous vendor vigilance, this continuous monitoring of a vendor master in the context of P2P, um, email Steve and or any of us will get back to you. Um, final comment is, you know, we all think there's a silver bullet somewhere. Sadly, there isn't. But all of these techniques and these ideas just make us more efficient and more effective and make um, kind of uh, the, our processes higher yield and higher gain. So that's what we've talked through. I'm going to come to a couple of questions. We are exactly at, we've got 44, so you've got a minute left, right, people? So keep asking your questions and we'll deal with that. That's what we've talked through. These are the email addresses. If you want to email anybody, do that. Uh, again, you'll get this, but I've got a question here. So our first question is for Deborah. We've got 7,000 suppliers in our portfolio. How many of these would you typically be able to address in a five-day engagement? There you go. Okay, so that's easy. Um, all of them, um, validations, reviewing the vendor records, finding duplicates. There's really a lot that can be done um, when you dedicate five days to a task. Um, also, it's a great question because if you thought you had 7,000 vendors and you have more, that happens all of the time. I can handle those two in the five days. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Deborah. Um, and here's one here. So how would you make the case, you kind of touched this already, but how would you make the case for action on vendor master data relative to other priorities? Steve? Yeah, great, uh, really good question. I think th there's a few things here, right? First of all is, um, you know, Dan shared with you the hack of detail, right? That kind of gives you that credible third party kind of objective look at, at what, what driving accurate vendor master data can really mean for uh for your 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 costs and your effectiveness within the organization i think that's a that's a great kind of opening kind of pitch but then i think to make it very real within your organization is to kind of you know embark on a little bit more detail like 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 i shared with around some of those kpis and some of those real world real life examples that you can point to in your business and you don't need you don't need a hundred of them, right? You, you need a handful of them, I would say, to really kind of get your message across. But that that's what really puts this in 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 real tangible terms inside your organization. I think if you do those two things, you're gonna you're definitely gonna get people's attentions and or get people's attention. You're gonna be able to assess really where you're at at, at, at that point in time. So that's what I would suggest. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. We've got a bunch of other questions, including some interesting ones around internal controls. But we don't have time. We'll deal with those by email. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Thank you especially to Deborah for uh, your eight steps, uh, Steve for your GBS leadership experience, and thank you all for spending 46 minutes with us. Uh, and uh, I wish you all happy holidays, happy Christmas, and happy the rest of the week, and happy month end, quarter end, year end, whatever he has coming up. And um, speak to you all soon. Thank you.